to be back. Now, when we were in the street in Ferguson, if you ever saw us in the street, it wasn't that we loved marching. It was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October of 2014. If we stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested. And I'm reminded of that so often because it helps me remember how fragile freedom was, how fragile freedom is. You know, one of the things that we carry with us every single day was this chant, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. A chant that you might have said in the street, a chant that we've said many times. Some people took that as a threat, but we understood it as a statement of fact, that any call for justice, any call for peace not rooted in a demand for justice was something that we didn't want. We wanted a living, breathing justice, a justice that we could feel and touch and see and hear, a justice that said Mike Brown was coming home today, a justice that said Tamir Rice was playing with his friends again and that Rakia Boy was going to another cookout. We wanted a justice made real, no justice, no peace, something that we wanted in our boardrooms, our bedrooms, our classrooms, our courtrooms, the streets, the suites. No justice, no peace was something that we understood and something that we carry with us in all of our work. I actually teach sixth grade math, and sixth grade is by far the best grade. Sixth grade is incredible. Seventh grade is puberty and deodorant, and it's rough. <laughs> but sixth grade is great. Seventh grade is like really hard. You know, Axe spray, if you ever think about Axe spray, seventh grade is the first time the kids need deodorant, and they literally drink Axe spray. You're like, why are you, what's going on? But sixth grade is still a lot of joy, and I'll never forget being a sixth grade teacher because I taught 60, 90, and 120 minute classes. And there was this one day my students were like, can we go to gym early? And I'm like, absolutely. Y'all are tired of me. I'm tired of you. Let's go to gym. And they go to gym and they come back really quickly. And I'm like, why are you back so quick? And what I realized is that they were in love with the idea of gym more than the work of gym. <laughs> and I say that because in this moment, I think people are more in love with the idea of resistance than the work of resistance. And what I want to talk about is like what the work looks like. So there are five big ideas that I'll share about how we dismantle, oh, the title's not up there, but it's called The Third Way. Like how do we dismantle the legacy of racism in this country or in our country, in the United States? So the first is that we acknowledge and we're honest about where we are today, that in America, one in three black men is projected to be incarcerated in their lifetime. A third of all the people killed by a stranger in the United States is actually killed by a police officer. Uh, the three biggest mental health facilities in the country are actually prisons and jails and not hospitals in the way that most people believe. And we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined, which is wild. And people ask me a lot, why am I making everything about race? And I'm like, I'm not making it about race. Race is making it about me. There are a lot of people who don't even realize how insidious race has been in the country, is that when you think about film, the history of film is that film was originally made for white skin, the Shirley card. It wasn't until 1995 that film was recalibrated to capture black skin. And the only reason it was recalibrated was because uh, chocolate makers and furniture makers were upset that it wasn't capturing mahogany furniture and chocolate correctly. So that's the only reason why Kodak came out with new film that in the end actually captured black, black and brown skin, which is wild. So the first thing is that we're honest about where we start. The second is that we never let the system off the hook. That I'm reminded that the best programs often exist because the system failed in the first place. The reason that we need a million after school programs to teach kids how to read and write is because we didn't teach them how to read and write during the school day. The fact that we need to feed homeless people under bridges is because they're homeless and we didn't guarantee housing. The fact that we need to figure out how, like, how to feed young people in streets and communities is because we haven't guaranteed food for people, even though we make enough food. That the system actually has to be the lens in the area that we focus on. I ask you to help me for a second and turn to the person next to you and tell them something that you can buy for $300. Do it, like for real. Something you can buy for $300. Did you do it? Okay, bring it back in five, four, three, to uh, get somebody over here, tell us something you could buy for $300. A cheap camera. A, ch a cheap camera. Okay, somebody over here. A sweater. A sweater, a what? A sweater. Okay, I heard two. A sweater and something else. Sneakers. Sneakers, okay. Over here. Outdoor and out. <laughs> <laughs> he works in cannabis, okay. <laughs> okay, over here. A, a, a phone, yep. So I say that because in Florida, to this day, theft over $300 is a felony, and when you become a felon, you permanently lose the right to vote and to ever run for public office. 
And I say that because a lot of people don't think about those things, that we hear the word felons, and you don't think about an 18-year-old who stole a bike at the age of 18 and forever lost the right to vote or to run for public office. You haven't thought about somebody who bought a pair of shoes or a phone at 18 and 19 and like lose the right to public services, welfare, those sort of things. So we're always mindful of the way the system actually is bearing down on people's lives, that we never ever let the system off the hook, that programs are important, but the system has to be the level that we fight at. The third is this idea of truth and reconciliation, that you've heard about truth and reconciliation before. What we would say is that the truth has to come before the reconciliation, that that is really the hard part for people. I was at a party, and it was a wearable art gala, so we were all wearing cool things, and I was wearing this jacket that had facts about uh, justice on it. One of the facts was that we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined, a third of all the people killed by strangers, killed by a police officer. And the fact down here was that uh, white high school dropouts have more wealth than all black college graduates in the United States, which is true. So this guy walks up to me, he says, is that true? And I'm like, yes. And he goes, I don't know. And I'm like, I don't know if you get not to know, like it's, this is just true. <laughs> and he's like, well, DeRay, the reason that white people have more wealth is that they're more white people. And I was like, mm, and I paused and I said to him, you know, the only reason that more white people is that you killed half the people and enslaved the other half. And he was like, oh. And I was like, he, and then he was like, the, uh, and I'm like, you definitely don't get to like not know about that, right? Like that actually happened. But it was this moment of reminding him that the only reason that white people have wealth in the United States is because we gave white people wealth. That we gave white people land, we gave them homes for 1% interest rates, we gave them free education, that we actually did that, that the government gave it to people. That it's only with people of color and poor people that suddenly we lose all of our imagination. We're like, we don't know what to do about homelessness. It's like, we actually did this already once. It's only with poor people and people of color that we say things like, everybody has to be a small business owner. It's like, I actually have, shouldn't have to own five small businesses to eat dinner. That that actually doesn't make sense. And that like part of what we have to do is like force people to deal with the truth before they start to engage in this act of reconciliation, that there's no way to actually reconcile that isn't actually rooted in the truth as a starting point. The fourth is that we share the cognitive burden, that we've all probably been in places where we're morally right, and sometimes what happens is like you give a speech to a friend and they are unmoved, and you give a better speech and they're sort of like, no, and you give the speech of a lifetime and they still haven't changed their minds. And like a lot of us have been there before, that part of the work is actually sharing the cognitive burden with people. That when I'm in rooms now and I talk to people about welfare, I'm not trying to convince you about the dignity of people. I'm saying, like, tell me what a four-year-old has to do to earn dinner. What does a seven-year-old have to do to be worthy of shelter? Like, you tell me. I want you to do some, co some cognitive work so that I'm not the only person out here thinking about these things. I do a lot of work around policing. And when I think about the police work, I was on a panel once with a police officer, and she said, DeRay, are you saying that the police should never kill somebody? And I said to her, well, when should the police kill your child? She was like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I don't know either, right? Like, like if you haven't thought about this, and like, why should another parent have to engage in that? And so much of our work is sharing the cognitive burden with people. It's not taking the cognitive burden as our only work, because too often we're just giving speeches at people and not having them like grapple with some of the issues. So when I think about the police work too, it's like in the country there are these rules that actually protect the police. So we think about in my home state of Maryland, the law literally says that you can file an anonymous complaint against an officer for everything except brutality. And we're like, well, that doesn't make sense. In Cleveland, they destroy police officer disciplinary records every two years. Also doesn't make sense. In Portland, Oregon, the, the contract literally says the officer has to be disciplined in the least embarrassing way to the officer. You're like, I don't even know what that means, right? <laughs> but when we talk to people about that, we, we are just saying to them, is that fair? Like, do you think that that makes sense? We're trying to share the cognitive work with people. And the reason that I call this talk the third way is that we think about organizing in the third way now. The first way is this idea of one issue. The second way is this idea of one entrance. The third way is this idea of many issues, many entrances. So if you've heard about Flint in the United States, Flint is a town in Michigan where the pipes have lead in them. And when most people think about lead, they think about environmental justice, as they should. Now, the thing that most people don't think about when they think about lead is that there's no cure, and the best that we can do is put kids in therapy. What people haven't yet acknowledged at scale about Flint, for instance, is that Flint has had the single biggest decrease in childhood literacy that we've ever recorded in the country, a 75% 75, 75 decrease in childhood literacy, which is wild. So when we think about Flint, it is not only an environmental justice issue, it's an educational justice issue. 
If you think about things like domestic violence, a lot of people think about domestic violence as a woman's rights issue, which, which it certainly is, because the majority of domestic violence survivors are women. What most people don't think about is that 50% of women and children who are homeless are actually fleeing domestic violence, and that there's a really interesting correlation between cell phones and domestic violence, and we're worried in the United States there's a government program to give uh, people cell phones. We're worried that this administration is actually gonna cut back on that program, and that what abusers do is that they actually ruin the credit of women so that women can't open accounts in their own name, so they can't get phone accounts too. So we're worried that when this program ends, there'll be women who literally just won't have access to phones anymore, and that that will actually lead to a spike in domestic violence. And again, that is about saying that like this is not one issue, there's not one entrance, there are many issues and entrances. And a third of all the young people who live in public housing in the country have asthma. And most people will do things like blame the parents or they're like, you know, it must be dirty. Fascinating is that like the link between uh, one of the reasons why so many kids have asthma is because of roaches, like when roaches die, like the dust is actually leading to this wild increase in asthma in public housing. So we think about it as an environmental justice issue and like a public safety and a housing issue. And when we think about this work, it is important to remember that like people don't leave one issue lives, like people don't enter into the work in one way. And part of what we have to do is make sure that we own that there are many entrances and many issues. It's good to be here. Thank you.